This evening we're going to uh, look at uh, one more of the commandments, the third commandment, as we've already said. And I'd like to begin by reading it out of Exodus chapter 20 in verse 7. Just, I believe, the one verse, Exodus 20, verse 7. <laughs> this is what the Lord says. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now again, let's not forget uh, the larger picture of what it is we're trying to do in the evening service. We are trying to understand what it means to live a life that is completely consecrated to the Lord. And that's certainly what the Lord calls you to do. That's what the Lord calls me to do as Christians. If you've been saved by His grace, you know that it's all you can do. If you've experienced the love of God, not just His love for you, but also the love He gives you for Him. That is what His love is moving you to do. And of course, there's always those enemies that are fighting against us. There's the flesh. Uh, there's the world, which the devil certainly is using. But we need to overcome these things and grow in our love for Him. We saw that that's really what was behind the first commandment, after all, to have no other gods before Him, to love God first and foremost of all, to love Him with your whole being, as our Lord said when He was asked, what is the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And even though the second commandment was like it, it's still not to supersede the first commandment because our Lord tells us on another occasion that our love for Him is to be so great that nothing else must even be a close second. Not your spouse, not your children, not your job, although anybody would love their job more than their Lord, or your possessions, or whatever it may be that draws your heart, certainly not the world. Now again, that commandment we have to place before everything else because it's really the root of being able to do what the Lord calls us to do. We have to take this seriously. Because if our hearts are not devoted to the Lord the way they should be, we are not going to be able to give Him our lives. We're not going to be able to do anything in the way that He calls us to do it. We're not even going to be able to love our spouses or others, our neighbors, ourselves, our enemies, in the way the Lord would have us to do it if we don't love Him first and foremost of all. Everything we do is to be done for that reason only. To love God, to do it for His glory, that is to be the main reason, the main motive for why we live. So the first commandment tells us that that's what we need to do. And as we saw in the second commandment, that loving Him most of all, putting Him first, we are to show Him that love by committing ourselves to His glory to live as the Lord would have us to live, to give ourselves to Him as, an, as a continual act of worship, even as the Apostle Paul says we are to offer ourselves to Him as living sacrifices. The second commandment, you'll recall, has to do with how we are not to worship the Lord, but in, in so doing it tells us how we are to worship Him if we are to give ourselves to Him in worship, we have to do it in a way that He's going to accept. It has to be as He commands, not just narrowly in our private worship and in our public worship, but more broadly in the way that we live. I believe that this commandment, again, because all the commandments are simply a summary of everything that we are to do for God's glory, because we love Him and are thankful to Him, the second commandment is really directing us in how we should live our whole lives and again, pointing us to the re remainder of these commandments as to how we are to do that. But if I were to summarize what this commandment is calling us to do, I would simply say this, it calls us to live as our Lord Jesus Christ lived. Now that was the principle we looked at a few Lord's, a few Lord's Day uh, evenings ago, but it's something we should never lose sight of. We should always do what Jesus Christ would do if He were in our place, in our situation, having to make our choices. That's what it means to worship God broadly, the way that we are to worship Him. What Jesus Christ would do is simply this, 
He would not seek his own pleasure in whatever decision he makes. He would always seek the pleasure of his father, and he would find pleasure in that. This principle really lays the groundwork, as I've said, for everything that follows. The rest of the commandments simply spell out in more detail just how we are to live, to give pleasure to him. And remember, if you love the Lord as he calls you to love him, the, really, uh, the only way you really can love him if you have his Holy Spirit, nothing is going to give you greater pleasure than giving the Lord pleasure. That's how you know that you really love him because you always want to please the one you love. If you love the Lord most of all, you will be seeking his pleasure in everything you do, just as the psalmist says. And, and one, uh, actually this would have been a good uh, memory verse uh, for tonight. The psalmist writes this in Psalm 73, verses 25 and 26. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That is how you and I are to love God, and he is certainly worthy of that love. Now this evening, let's consider that one of the things that does give pleasure to God is when we use his name reverently. The third commandment basically says it in a negative way. and We saw why it is that these things are often spoken of negatively. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, I want us to understand what that means this evening. If we're to give pleasure to God, we need to see what it is we need to avoid. First thing we want to look at is that we are not to use God's name as a common swear word or blaspheme him. We're going to look at what that means. Secondly, this means that we are to be careful to do what we say. We are to keep the promises that we make. And finally, we want to see what the Lord says that he will do to those who do not keep this commandment because there is a warning that's uh, mentioned in here. So first of all, if you are to live the kind of life the Lord calls you to live, if you are to consecrate and devote yourself to the Lord, one of the things that means is to use his name respectfully. Perhaps the best way to understand how we are to use the name of God is by understanding how we shouldn't use it as the Lord tells us in this commandment. We misuse his name whenever we don't use it respectfully. And again, the ways that we can do that first is by using it as a swear word or worse, if we blaspheme him. Sometimes we don't really understand what it is this commandment is really driving at, but we you know, what, what the Lord is saying is, do not use my name in vain. We need to understand, of course, what vain means. Vain means empty. Vain means to lift his name up or to use it for no good purpose. Uh, it, it's, it's basically, well, again, I think that's probably the best way to put it. It's, it's not using it reverently, but rather using it as though it is insignificant. I thought this might work as an illustration. You'll notice that in Pilgrim's Progress, that in, well, actually, we, may we, we haven't gotten there yet, but we will shortly. As Christian and faithful are walking along, they have to pass through a particular town. And that town is called Vanity Fair. The word vanity comes from the same root as the word vain. This is where faithful is going to die for his testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does this represent? What does the town represent? The town represents the world. The world, not in the sense as, as God made it, nor the good things that he has put in the world, but rather those things that are in the world that are either sinful or the things that are really empty and useless, the things which may be lawful or unlawful, but which ultimately will do you no good, and perhaps do you a great deal of harm, especially if they're sinful, or if they get you off the path. They are empty things. They are vain things. They are useless. They are meaningless. And all these things are going to be burned up on the last day. Maybe that gives you an idea of what vanity means or to lift the Lord's name up as something that is empty or useless or meaningless. When it's applied to his name, it means to take it lightly or to use it for some worthless purpose or for some empty reason. 
what the Lord is telling us is that his name must always be used with the greatest reverence, the greatest respect, and with the greatest love. You've got to re remember that when you're using the name of God, you're actually talking about him. You're bringing him into what it is you're saying. And the same thing would be true if you're talking about someone else. If I, if I use Dick's name, I'm talking about Dick. If I use Shirley's name, I'm, 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 I'm talking about her or Denise or Mark or any of us here. When you use somebody's name, you're not just using a word. You're actually talking about them. When you use God's name, for whatever reason, you are bringing God into the conversation. You are talking about him. You're referring to him. And when you bring his name into a conversation, you should always do it with the greatest respect. And that certainly applies to any of the names by which God reveals himself to us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus, Jesus Christ. We need to use his name reverently. Now, what does the Lord here warn us against? What is it we are not supposed to be doing? How should you not use God's name? Well, first of all, you should not use his name or any of his names as exclamations, as swear words. When you get angry, when you do that, you are using his name in an empty, worthless, meaningless way that dishonors him. I mean, think about what you're doing when you actually do use his name as a swear word or really any swear words. You're just using them to satisfy your anger. Maybe you get angry at a situation. That's usually when people are tempted to swear. Or maybe when you get angry at somebody, you want to swear at them because it, it sort of uh, satisfies your desire for revenge against them. You want to hurt them with your words because of something maybe they've done to you or maybe something you think they've done to you. When you use God's name to do this, you are not respecting him. You're not using his name reverently. You're not loving him, but you are using his name in vain. By the way, I do want to remind you, and I hope you already have experienced this as Christians, that if it's wrong for you to use his name in this way, it's wrong for anyone to use his name in this way, and you should always be offended when you hear the Lord's name being misused. Now, what should you do when you hear the Lord's name being misused? Well, if there's something you can do about it, you should try. Try to help people who are using uh, his word as, or his name as a swear word to stop doing that. Perhaps if there's some fear of the Lord there, maybe they'll change. If they happen to be an angry person. They happen to fall into the category that uh, our Lord talks about, don't cast your pearl before swine. Maybe the best thing to do is pray for them. But if the Lord gives you the opportunity, witness to them. Try to evangelize them. Try to turn them away from dishonoring the Lord. It should always offend us when the one that we love is offended. And every time his name is lifted up and used as a swear word like that, that is offensive to God. But there is another way that his name can be used in vain, and that is when the Lord is blasphemed. Now, I think in this case, that's when the anger is directed not against somebody else, but rather it's directed against the Lord. When we get angry at Him, hopefully we don't do that. Or when we say something about God that isn't true, or especially if we say something evil about Him. Now, Jesus, I think, gives us a great example of what it means to blaspheme one of the members of the Godhead when He talks about uh, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Remember on the occasion that he was casting out demons, that the Pharisees saw him and he said he cast out demons by the prince of demons. Jesus said when they said that, that they had blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And he says that that particular sin is unpardonable. He says in Matthew 12, verses 31 through 32, Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man shall be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. To blaspheme the Holy Spirit means to speak against him. To blaspheme the Holy Spirit means to say something evil about him. 
Now, I think there's something more that's involved here with regard to the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I think it's not only uh, saying something like that against him, but knowing that you are doing so. I do believe that the Pharisees understood when they saw the works that Jesus Christ was doing, that he was casting out demons, and he was actually plundering Satan's house, that those Pharisees knew that he was doing that by the Spirit of God, and yet they were so filled with hatred against Christ that they were willing to say this against him, knowing that it must be the Spirit of God by which he was doing this. And that is what aggravated their sin so greatly. I don't believe any Christian could ever commit this sin. I always have to say that when I talk about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because I know that some of us perhaps at one time have feared that we might have committed that sin. But no true Christian can actually commit this sin. For one thing, the Bible says, if you are a believer, you, you will never lose your salvation. You'll never be lost. And certainly one who commits the sin cannot be forgiven. Uh, the love of God in your heart would never allow you to reach the point where you could uh, treat that holy one of God so, uh, you know, so disrespectfully by attributing any evil to him. Now, I do believe that the Lord says that he won't forgive this sin because the heart that is able to commit this sin has become so hard. It's likely that the Spirit of God, since he's the one who changes the heart, if you continually harden your heart against him to the point where you would actually commit this sin and, and call him an unclean spirit, is really to go past the point of no return. But again, it does give, you know, that's something a Christian can't do. But I think it does give us an idea of what blasphemy is all about, and especially the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. To use God's name in vain means to use it in an empty, meaningless or sinful way. If you are to live in devotion to the Lord, you've got to use his name reverently. Certainly that's what you want to do. You must always speak to him and about him with the greatest love and respect and also stand up for his honor when his name is dishonored by those around you. Now, there is another way that it's possible to take the, name, the Lord's name in vain, and I think that that's it's probably, it's pri uh, I, I might say it's a, the, the primary meaning of, of this particular commandment, the, the main thing that the Lord has in view, and that is to make a promise, to take a vow, or to swear an oath, and yet to do it in a way that is, is not true to your word to make a promise to do something and not do it, to swear to the truth of something and yet knowing that that is not true or to swear to the falsity of something knowing that it's not false. Whenever you call God to bear witness to something that isn't true, whether by way of promise or by way of uh, you know, affirmation, you take his name in vain. You know, there was a time when our nation recognized that, that um, we needed to, to, uh, to treat God's name very reverently. You know, um, uh, last time I was um, uh, called to jury duty and had a chance to see uh, somebody put their hand on, on, well, actually, I was waiting to see somebody put their hand on the Bible. They don't do that anymore. But there was a time when they did do that, a time when the fear of the Lord was so strong that the courts would compel a man, a woman, whoever is going to bear witness, to put their hand on the Bible and to swear in God's name to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And the fear of the Lord was such that anyone who would do that would be afraid that if they said something that wasn't true, that God's wrath would fall on them. I think we've long since departed that kind of fear in our nation. And I think our, our, the magistrate, our leaders, um, don't exact that kind of an oath any longer because they're trying to create the separation between church and state, but it does illustrate what we're talking about. Whenever we vow to do something in God's name, or we take an oath that something is true or false, we need to mean what we say. If we don't, we're breaking this commandment. We're offending God. We're using His name in vain because we are lifting it up to emptiness, to something we really do not mean. 
Now, I do believe that, that this applies to everything that we promise and everything that we affirm to be true or false, whether we swear in the name of God or not. You remember that Jesus was reproving the Jews for making their false vows and taking their false oaths because they made them by swearing by, by the gold of the temple or by the offering that's on the altar or by heaven, thinking that when they did this, they were avoiding swearing in the name of God, and so they really weren't calling God to bear witness to what they were saying, and they really weren't binding themselves by what they were saying. You know, today, people cross their fingers. Oh, I didn't really mean it. My fingers were crossed, so it doesn't count, you know, this kind of thing. They were doing the same thing with their oaths and vows. I didn't really swear by God, but I swore by the gold in the temple, not by God, but by heaven, not by the altar, but by the offering that's on the altar. But Jesus reminded them that the temple, the gold, the offering, the altar, heaven, that everything is really connected to God. And so when they swore by these things, they were really swearing by God, even though they thought they weren't doing that. I believe our Lord was telling us there that everything is connected to God in one way or another. And when you make a promise, you really can't avoid having God as your witness, which is why Jesus said to them, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. Anything beyond that is of evil. If you say yes, if you say you're going to do something, then let your yes be yes. If you say yes, do it. If you say no, don't do it. If you say this is true, it better be true. At least you better believe it's true. And if you say it's false, then you better believe that this is really false. Otherwise, you are using the Lord's name in vain. Again, I hope you understand the, you know, the, uh, the, the way this works out. The Lord is telling us what not to do in order that we may know what it is we are to do. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Keep your promises. And so if you were to live a life devoted to the Lord, that's what you need to do. When you say you're going to do something, make sure that you do it. If you make a promise, you just can't break it. If you do, you're sinning against the Lord. The Lord calls us into account for the words we speak. When we commit ourselves to something, we need to do it. Otherwise, again, we're taking God's name in vain. Now, thirdly, what does the Lord say that he will do if we take his name in vain? Again, look at uh, Exodus 20, verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. The Lord says that he will punish you accordingly if you do this. Now, we certainly do have examples in Scripture of what happens to those who are unrepentant as well as what the Lord will do to or for the repentant. Again, think about the, where Jesus was reproving the Pharisees for their false vows. Jesus had some pretty harsh words for them. He called them fools. He called them blind guides. He called them hypocrites because of the vows they were taking. They were two-faced. They were not being honest. They were, again, dishonoring God. In Matthew 23, where he reproves them for these things, he actually ends with the promise of a curse that was going to fall upon them in which he was going to charge them with all the righteous blood shed on earth, all that they and their fathers had done. Now, it wasn't just for breaking the third commandment. It was much more than that. But their hypocrisy was one of the reasons God was going to judge them. We already saw what Jesus said would happen to those who blasphemed the Holy Spirit. That was something that would never be forgiven. The Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. We have an example of a man who, who came out with Israel out of Egypt, who was the uh, son of an Israelite woman, but we don't know whether the father was an Israelite or not, but he blasphemed God's name. And this is a good example of what the Lord thinks about blasphemy against him. This is from Leviticus 24, verses 11 through 16. The son of the Israelite woman blasphemed the name and cursed. So they brought him to Moses. 
They put him in custody so that the command of the Lord might be made clear to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring the one who is cursed outside the camp, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head. Then let all the congregation stone him. You shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, If anyone curses his God, then he will bear his sin. Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregations shall certainly stone him, the alien as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. Now, again, thankfully, God has shown himself to be uh, merciful in the new covenant. I mean, he was merciful in the old covenant as well. But this tells us that God is jealous for his glory and that he holds accountable those who misuse his name if he doesn't do it in this life, certainly the Lord will do it in the life to come. To blaspheme the name of God is very serious. Now, one thing we do need to be thankful for is that even though we may be guilty of the sin of misusing God's name to one degree or another, and I really think that all of us have at some point in our lives, you know, whether uh, before we came to Christ and perhaps even being tempted to do so after, one thing we need to be thankful for is that this sin is not unpardonable. The only, the only unpardonable sin that we're aware of is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which no Christian can ever commit. If you repent of your sins, the Lord will forgive you of those sins. Paul was somebody who blasphemed Christ. And he also tried to make Christians blaspheme him. But when he repented, the Lord had mercy on him and forgave him. He writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 through 14, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. You know, as we think about this one part, he was shown mercy because he acted ignorantly in unbelief. I mean, sometimes we've been tempted perhaps to get angry at God. Sometimes you know, we may have been tempted to even to use the Lord's name in vain. If we hear it you know, very much around us, when we get angry, sometimes we're tempted to think it. Sometimes we may be tempted to use it, in which case we didn't do it ignorantly as Paul did. And yet, the Lord says there is still mercy, there is still forgiveness, because if you are the Lord's, there is nothing that you can ever do that will separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So on the one hand, we need to remember that, that the Lord takes the, the reverence of, or the reverencing of his name, the respect respecting of his name very seriously. And he deals with those who are unrepentant very seriously, even uh, executing someone for bla blaspheming his name. But you also need to remember that none of the sins that you've committed, even if they have been along these lines, will ever condemn you if you have turned from those sins and trusted in the Lord. So again, there are consequences for dishonoring the Lord's name, but Let's remember, on the other hand, what this is really calling us to do in the first place, which is to honor him, to use his name respectfully, to, um, you know, you, well, to keep our, our promises, not, of course, to um, use his name as a swear word, not to, use, not to blaspheme him, but rather to honor him, rather to use his name respectfully, and to make sure that we actually do keep the promises that we've made. If we do that, if we do what the Lord calls us to do, then we are honoring Him. And the Lord tells us that if we will honor Him, He will honor us. He says in 1 Samuel 2.30, those who honor me, I will honor. You know, the sad thing about life is the fact that being born into this world we seem to think that this world's important. We seem to think that we have to have the things of the world. So 
We spend, most people in the world spend most of their life trying to get the things of the world. And one of the things that is in the world that people want so much is honor. They want honor, they want glory, they want recognition and so forth. They want people to see them, to applaud them, to recognize them. Everybody seems to be seeking honor. But yet the Bible tells us that if we want true honor, honor that is going to last beyond this life and even in the life to come, the way that we should seek it is entirely the opposite of what is taking place in the world. We should be seeking it, of course, by humbling ourselves and doing what it is that God calls us to do. Seeking to honor Him, to put Him first, and to make His name known to others and to make sure that as best as we possibly can, we honor His name and others do it as well. If we do that, the Lord says that He will honor us. And that really is the only honor that we ought to be seeking. And really, until we can get the world's honor out of our sights and out of our hearts, we're not really going to be able to seek God's honor as we should. But this is the true honor. This is the honor that really makes a difference. God knows how to honor those who honor Him. If you would have it, it's got to come by devoting your life to Him. Not only, in, of course, in the way we've seen this evening, but in every way. But with regard to what we've seen this evening, if you would receive the honor that the Lord has to give, you have to honor Him in this way. And so examine your, examine your hearts, your lives, and whether or not you've been keeping your promises, whether or not you have been using the Lord's name reverently, whether or not you, you are being careful always to speak of Him reverently and, and to think of Him reverently, and whether or not you have been keeping your promises Here's a, a few things that we can think about. For those of you who are married, are you keeping your marriage vow? That was a vow you made to the Lord. Are you seeking to fulfill that? If you're a member of this church, you know that there were those five questions that you were asked. Some, some of you were asked only four questions, but you know that uh, the five questions reflect whether you say them or not, whether you commit yourself to them or not, they still reflect what the Lord requires of you. You know, have you kept those vows? Do you believe still that the Bible is true? There's only one way of salvation, that you are hopeless apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And are you seeking, as the Lord calls you to, to put your sins to death and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and live for His glory? That's what we all owe the Lord. Have you been keeping those vows? If you made other promises to the Lord or to anyone else, are you keeping those promises? Are you being careful to keep them? The Bible says in Psalm 15, verse 4, the righteous man, and this would include women and children, it's mankind, you know, the righteous man swears to his own hurt and does not change. What that means is once he has committed himself to do something, he will keep that promise. Of course, it's not a sinful promise. And if it doesn't, of course, do anything sinful in keeping it, if it's something that you've committed yourself to that is good and right, you do it, even if it hurts you. And certainly to live as a Christian in this world will certainly could end up hurting you. But you have to be willing to pay. The righteous man swears to his own hurt and does not change. Once you have committed yourself to do something, you do it. I had a friend growing up uh, when uh, late teens, early 20s, uh, he took this very, very seriously, maybe not this particular um, passage here, but the principle that was involved in it. He knew that once he said yes to something, he had to do it, and he would always do it when he said yes, so the way he would avoid you know, doing that is that he wouldn't commit to it. <laughs> it was hard to get him to commit to anything, but the reason is he understood that he had to keep his word once he, once he said it, and that's what the Lord is calling us to do. When we make a commitment, we need to keep our promises, our commitments. So are you keeping them? Now, again, if you failed in any way to keep those commitments, and we all have failed to keep them, what we need to do is remember that there is mercy and there is grace. We need to confess our sins to the Lord. We need to turn away from our breaking of those commitments, and we need, again, to purpose in our hearts to do what it is that, the, that we have committed ourselves to do, to do what we know is honoring to the Lord. So may the Lord give us the grace to love Him most of all, 
and to devote ourselves to him, to, to live, as it were, a life of worship, and in doing that, to honor his name, not only by speaking of him reverently, but also by keeping our promises. This is really what gives pleasure to the Lord. This is what honors him. And since it does, that is what should give us pleasure as well. May the Lord grant that it does. Let's bow in a few moments of prayer and let's ask for the Lord to help us to do that.